Good morning. On right yeah, now? We're, we're on. Oh, this is real. Hey, good morning, everybody. It is Thursday. It is August 6th. They said we may be coming straight out to you guys. It just was so sudden. You ready now? I'm ready now. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. We are uh, found out about a new, inexpensive smart mask that will not only be able to amplify your voice, it can translate languages. I would love to have mm -hmm. one of these. So a Japanese robotics company has developed a smart mask that can ampli amplify, vo amplify voices, mm -hmm. transcribe dictation, and translate speech into eight different languages, and they will be available to the public as soon as September. The C mask was designed by a Japanese tech startup, Donut Robotics, how awesome is that, mm -hmm. to improve communication between airline workers and supermarket employees during during the COVID-19 pandemic. The mask, which is Bluetooth connected to the user's iPhone, is capable of translating Japanese into Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, Indonesian, English, Spanish, and French. The company originally developed their AI-based translation tech for their Cinnamon robot to assist international travelers at the airport. They've done some crowdfunding. They've raised a ton of money. And here, towards the end of the article, it says after concluding another round of crowdfunding in July, Donut Robotics says their first 5,000 to 10,000 masks will be distributed across Japan coming up in December. Here's the great part. Each of the masks is expected to cost between $40 and $50. I think that's very reasonable. It is for, for what it does. And it says the company is hoping to expand distribution to the UK and the US by next spring. Now, here's the funny thing. It can do eight languages, but can it make it... Can I make it where we can actually understand each other just basically? Because sometimes I feel either I'm getting hard of hearing or some people are not very good at speaking with their mask on. I, you know what I mean? I know what you mean. And what I love about this is that, you know, when you go to curbside, mm -hmm. and he, the workers sometimes have to get really close to mm -hmm. you to mm -hmm. hear you. But maybe that will help and keep a social distance of six feet away. As it says, it amplifies. So probably is going to help. <laughs> All right. Let's take a look at our rundown. Children are almost, and I would almost say definitely, but almost immune from this disease. It's a message he posted on Facebook, but Facebook has since removed his post, saying the claims are false and harmful. School vaccinations are still needed this year, even if children are learning from home, and that includes college students as well. The Texas Department of State Health Services announced rules on school vaccinations. The massive explosion in Beirut, Lebanon. At least 150 people are confirmed dead. Investigators say the explosive compound from the blast is being traced back to a Russian cargo ship. New fallout for YouTube star Jake Paul, the controversial vlogger making new headlines after FBI agents raided his mansion near LA. Police seizing multiple firearms. More than 40 straight days of rain are causing major damage in South Korea. Floods and landslides have killed at least 15 people and for some 1,500 from their homes. Americans are spending more money on groceries. New figures show the price of beef and veal is up 20 percent. Eggs are up 10 percent and pork more than 8 percent. Major League Baseball is making a new move to enforce safety protocols. They'll now require players and staff to wear face coverings in the dugouts. Violators could be banned for the season. Cheetos launching three flavors of its new mac and cheese. It'll be available in both boxes and single serve cups, but only at Walmart. Krispy Kreme giving out free donuts and coffee for all educators next week. They also give everyone who orders a dozen donuts an extra special straight a dozen, Tuesday, August 11th. The engineless a vehicle was spotted in Ukraine. The horse in front trotting in the slow lane as it pulls the car down the street, but they get great gas mileage on it. It's definitely one horsepower, isn't it? <laughs> one horsepower. One horsepower. Let's go outside with live cam. It's definitely a warm start to our Thursday. Justin Horn back for Mike Ostrich. Those morning clouds kind of hanging around, but that's been the typical pattern lately. Yeah, give it another hour and it'll be uh, probably full sun. We're, we're already up to 80 degrees uh, here in San Antonio right now. We're off to a warm start, as, as Mark mentioned, in high temperatures today. Ah, you guessed it, right around 100, uh, right where we were yesterday. 99 Honda, 97 Curva, 102. The high temperature in New Braunfels this afternoon. Next couple days, Eh, 100, no surprise. Maybe on Saturday, a degree cooler. There's an outside chance of a shower developing on the coast Saturday. One or two of those could drift towards San Antonio, but right now it looks like our rain chances really are 
uh, below 10%. It's not great. And uh, anything we see would be really, really light. Temperature-wise, again, right now, 80 degrees, 79 Port SA, 75 Bernie Stage. You see some of those clouds there. You go east to Bear County, and it uh, already is sunny. Places like Floresville, you're seeing quite a bit of sun. Uh, these clouds will scatter out, mostly sunny, noontime, 91. And uh, once again, <laughs> we'll say the number 100 today. Uh, and we'll have a look at the rest of your forecast. We'll also talk about it being a CPS Energy Peak Energy Day. We'll have the details on that here in just a few minutes. Guys. Thank you, Justin. We're taking a look at Trans Guide 37 and 9th. Looks pretty smooth there. And that's 281 at 410. Also, traffic moving pretty smoothly. But first, we want to update you this morning about an accident on the city's west side. Police say the northbound lanes of Loop 410 near Alamo Downs are now back open. The accident happened just after 530 this morning. Officers tell us a man was trying to cross the highway when he was hit by an 18 wheeler. The man was taken to University Hospital in critical condition. Police tell us the driver of the big rig stopped after the crash and is not expected to face any charges. Top stories we are following today. We now know the name of the man hit and killed by a vehicle on the northeast side Monday night. Medical examiner's office has identified him as Paul Ralph Pardo. Police say a passerby found Pardo just before midnight Monday near Nacogdoches and Salado Cliff Drive. It's not far from Lady Bird Johnson Park. Police tell us Pardo had severe head trauma and was pronounced dead at the scene. At last check, investigators were still looking for that driver that hit him. A San Antonio police officer behind bars this morning facing charges of sexual assaults. And new at 9, the Bear County Magistrate's Office has released his mug shot. This is Officer Umberto Zuniga. Police say they responded to a sexual assault on August 1st on the south side. The victim told police Zuniga had sex with her without her consent. She said she managed to stop him by grabbing a knife and cutting his arm. Police tell us Zuniga is an 18-year veteran of SAPD. He will be placed on administrative leave until further notice. City staff will present a proposed $2.9 billion budget to city council members this morning. That budget for San Antonio includes tens of millions of dollars in various spending cuts because of expected revenue shortfalls related to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, the police department, which many activists have called for a defunding, would actually see a increase, though the budget includes some cuts to SAPD for things like overtime and switching a violence prevention program to Metro Health, officers could get up to a 5% pay raise, so the overall budget would go up by about $8 million. City Manager Eric Walsh says he's proposing a process for reviewing how the city could change its policing model, but he doesn't expect that to be finished with a final report until April. You can watch today's council meeting live on KSAT.com. Any morning headlines, a woman attacked for wearing a mask, just not correctly, according to her attacker, and not exactly the wedding memories a couple in Beirut were hoping for. A lightning strike caught on camera and a couple of garbage men turning into cowboys. Our David Sears is here. Good morning, David. That's your funny video of the week. This is this is pretty funny stuff. So we'll end on a good note, but first let's start with some mask mania. We'll take you to Hackensack, New Jersey. You see the woman at the checkout counter of a Staples store. This all caught her in surveillance video, and that is Terry Thomas walking up to that woman, telling her she wasn't wearing, wearing her mask correctly, according to police, and she just grabbed the woman, ends up throwing her to the floor. You can see that woman needed a cane. Matter of fact, she just had a transplant surgery of her liver. While she was getting tossed to the floor, she broke her leg. She laid there a while before somebody came to help, so it's back to the hospital for her, off to jail for Terry Thomas. She was arrested and now has a court appearance later this month. Let's take it to Beirut. You have probably seen this video of this massive explosion at the port there. It was one of those things no one knew was coming. This bride getting her pictures taken on the big day and then all of a sudden. Yeah, the shockwave so powerful. The photographer got shoved down the street by by it. People, including the bride and groom, just took off running. There they go. When I hear the explosion, one thing came into my mind that now my life has changed from wedding happiness into um, a sad moment. Now I, I'm, I'm not going to be the bride. Now I'm going to die. Well, the good news is no one in that wedding party died. No one was even hurt in that wedding party, but there are some serious wedding memories. All right, this is a rare moment, but a scary one. Watch the tree. 
Watch it. Watch it. Did we, yeah, right there. That's a lightning strike right in front of Justin Howard nailing that tree. This is in Houston. Howard just getting some video of the rain on his phone with that lightning hit. That was a 50 foot tall pine tree. He said he wasn't hurt, but he was feeling it the next day. And let's take it to Rio de Janeiro. Mark, you got this? You got those dance steps? Yeah, this is a cop. He is directing traffic, but because of the pandemic, he has to uh, kind of change his methods a little bit. Can't use a whistle because he's wearing a mask. So instead, there you go. I, yeah. So that's how he gets the traffic moving. And it's like right in, right in step with the traffic too. And the people. Look at that. Pretty good. He's been directing traffic for 21 years. And you know, you always just kind of adapt with the time. So there we go. That's, yeah, he's got that, some of us oh. Look, look, look at this. <laughs> this is the funniest video of the day right there. That's a garbage man in Houston. They're going to pick up some garbage and they found that horse sitting there. <laughs> Apparently the stuffed horse has a broken leg. So the guy just thought he'd take it for a ride before he throws it away. Like, it's like a rodeo broke out on the streets as we were collecting the trash. That's just, I, I just I just think that's hilarious. I'm Reliving just living those childhood moments. Just, hey, you got to have some fun these days. You do. You know, even in a job like that, you, you might as well enjoy yourself. So before it goes off to the great uh, horse home in the sky, I guess he had to take it for a hey, Back to ride. that lightning strike. Do you see it blew the bark right off that <sighs> right pine off the tree. tree? That's a 50 foot tall pine tree and it didn't so, fall. So the guy wasn't I mean, injured, but he was feeling, he was, I mean, I guess you feel the voltage. Oh, the it's shakes? that close. Yeah, I'm sure he, he felt, felt a little the next day. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> terrifying. It's like right there. What an amazing video. Scary. Talk sports coming up. Yep. Thank First. you, sir. All right. We sort of have to. 909, 80 <laughs> degrees still ahead on GMSA at 9. Coming 12 miles in seven hours. That's what a 13 year old boy from California did over the weekend. What he hopes to accomplish next. Did Texas leaders overstep their bounds by awarding a pandemic related contract to a little known tech firm? A small group of conservatives says yes, and they've filed a lawsuit. Details on who they're suing and why later in our Tribune Thursday report. Many people are hopeful that a coronavirus vaccine will bring an end to the pandemic. This week's episode of Case That Explains takes a look at the search for a vaccine. RJ Marquez is here to help us break it down. Check the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and it is up about 50 points at 27,249. Welcome back. We have been living with COVID-19 for the better part of 2020. The virus has changed our lives and we all want to know when will this end. This week's episode of Case Out Explains is all about the search for a coronavirus vaccine. RJ Marquez is in house this morning, joining us live from the newsroom to tell us more about the episode. RJ, good to see you in studio. Now, what were some of the things that you learned and where are we right now with a potential vaccine? Yeah, good to see you guys. Good morning. Uh, so obviously the biggest thing right now has been patience because we keep on hearing that it's going to be months and that is kind of going to be the case here. The federal government has set a goal of January 2021, so next January to deliver hopefully uh, 300 million doses of a safe vaccine. So that may seem like a long time, but the truth is that these vaccines usually take years to produce. Uh, what you're going to find in this episode is that we actually did a timeline of how long it kind of takes to make these vaccines and where we are right now. And when you really kind of think about what goes into it, it's all about these clinical trials that are taking place right now. Uh, they're conducted to make sure that people stay safe and to make sure that they are, there are no side effects. Of course, everybody's body is different, so that's kind of the big key right now. But the good thing is that there are, that this is a global effort. So there are scientists, doctors from around the world working on this right now to get us to this goal of hopefully uh, 2021 early 2021. RJ, you mentioned safe vaccine. That is a process. What did you learn about how that works getting to a safe vaccine for all of us? Yeah, Mark, so there are three different phases that a vaccine has to go through. So, and of course, this involves all the clinical trials. Right now, there are more than 160 vaccines that are currently being trialed. And just to kind of give you an idea, six of them right now are in phase three. One has been approved for a limited use. So Moderna is the one that is currently in phase three. And uh, again, a lot of this has to 
sort of look at it, how the human body sort of interacts with this. One part of this episode was we did a uh, segment on how vaccines interact with the body and basically what they do and how vaccines work to kind of build our own defense systems and to kind of train our body to recognize these, uh, recognize these antigens, um, this bacteria, these viruses that are coming into our body for future use. So this isn't just gonna be something that uh, can be done right away. This is gonna be something that we're obviously gonna be dealing with for years, because even if we get a vaccine, it's gonna take time to sort of see how the general population reacts. RJ, you mentioned clinical trials, especially Moderna. Are any of those happening in San Antonio? Yes, yeah, Sarah. Uh, but that is a big part of these uh, clinical trials right now. Clinical Trials of Texas out in the medical center is actually in charge of four COVID-19 vaccine trials. Two of them, uh, Moderna and Pfizer, which we talked about, are currently underway. And right now they are screening participants. They are looking for participants. We spoke to a uh, doctor from San Antonio who is actually one of these participants. So there's a lot to be done here in the city of San Antonio. And I think what makes San Antonio an interesting location for these clinical trials is that this is a melting pot city uh, but, you know this is our demographics kind of extend pretty far and there are a lot of different ailments a lot of different things that people in San Antonio deal with or go through daily so this is a good city to kind of get um, to get a good idea of how far these vaccines will take us RJ how can folks watch yeah, guys, so you could go on our website right now, ksat.com. That's the easiest place to watch. You could stream it on your smart TV, uh, Roku, our KSAT TV app. And so that is available for you right now. Uh, this is a crisp 24 minute episode. So I think that a lot of people are going to be able to learn a lot that comes into not only making vaccines, sort of what they have to go through, but also sort of the challenges we have ahead of us uh, once we get a uh, hopefully a vaccine for COVID-19. RJ, thank you so much. And 24 minutes. I definitely watch that. That's, I mean, it's the topic on all of our minds right now. Absolutely, guys. Thank RJ, you. we'll talk to you a little bit later on more about yeah. Spurs Nuggets. That is coming up right here on GMS 8 9. But Justin is back now. And CPS Energy wants us all to ease up on the grid later today. It's another one of those days. We saw a few of them in July, and now we have another one today. So it is a CPS Energy peak energy use day, meaning they, uh, there's going to be a little bit of stress on the power grid. So they're asking people sort of conserve energy a little bit this afternoon, especially between 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. So let's take a look at the KSAP power saver here. Uh, again, it's th that's sort of the time frame we got to watch. And of course, we know it's going to be hot today, but some of the things you can do, minimize appliance use, turn off lights in empty rooms, close window blinds and shades. You can even grill outside. Sometimes that helps, you know, keeping some of the heat out of the kitchen. So just a couple ideas there uh, and something to keep in mind. Let's talk about rainfall. It's uh, not been a good summer for us. We started off in January and we're looking at the graph here. This green color is the actual rainfall that we've seen here in 2020. The red is the average or normal. So in January, we did pretty good. February, we were a little bit below average. March, we were a little bit below average. Then April and May, we sort of made up for that deficit. We picked up 5.83 inches in May. That's pretty good. Then we hit June and it all fell apart. Uh, June, well below average. July, well below average. In August, uh, we started off okay, but uh, it looks like we may be below average for the month of August, too, unless we can get more rain in here by the end of the month. So we're uh, about four inches below average for the year. It's just uh, not been a great summer for us. And you look at the drought monitor, and this just came in about an hour or so ago. Uh, we are seeing now extreme drought starting to show up again. Look prior down to Crystal City. That's the same area that's sort of been suffering all year and then out towards Del Rio also extreme drought and we're starting to see that sort of spread towards San Antonio. Now, obviously the rains that we saw this weekend and Monday went a long way to help us out. Uh, but if this uh, dry streak continues, we'll start to see it go the other way again. Medina Lake about 58% full. It's down about 20 feet from the conservation pool and it's down about 10 feet from where it was six months ago. So Medina Lake still struggling a little bit too. Big picture here shows that we've got some unsettled weather across the plains. You get up into the Rocky Mountains, you'll find some showers there, a little bit of rain and some severe weather potentially up there around uh, New York City. But all in all, it's, it's a pretty quiet weather pattern across the entire country and temperatures pretty average for this time of year. You'll find some comfortable numbers. No surprise up there around Portland and Seattle where temperatures are around 60. For us, we're about 20 degrees warmer, 80 degrees right now here in San Antonio, and we should be up around 100 this afternoon as our ridge of high pressure builds and strengthens and just keeps things rather toasty. Mostly cloudy right now. Again, 80 at the airport. We've got a good southerly breeze. You can see some of those clouds working through and temperatures 
I'd say upper 70s, low 80s, just about everywhere. Those morning clouds will burn off pretty quickly. Heat index is already starting to kick in. Feels like 84 here in town and already feels like 90 in Gonzales. So our forecast calls for a high right around 100 degrees, mostly sunny. Heat index could go as high as 105. 100 tomorrow, little cooler, and I say a little, it's a degree. Uh, 99 Saturday, partly cloudy. There could be a couple showers right on the coast, but we're not too uh, excited about that because it will probably stay down to our south and east. We're not expecting much here in San Antonio. Guys. So remember to keep your thermostats a little higher today. Yes. Make, this, make the sacrifice. Hold off on the laundry, at least for a little while. That's right. Thank you, Justin. 921, 80 degrees. Still ahead on GMSA at 9, a 13-year-old boy in California did something most people can't imagine. How he became the youngest person to ever swim across Lake Tahoe. A California teenager has become the youngest person to complete what's known as the Godfather swim across Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe waves, they can get a little choppy. The 13 year old completed the 12 mile swim in less than seven hours. James Savage says he has always loved to swim and he, Lake Tahoe isn't his only feat. He also swims across the Golden Gate Bridge in Alcatraz every year. I don't know what made him fall in love with it you know when he was younger and he told me mom i want to swim from alcatraz we kind of laughed in his face <laughs> i mean who entertains that idea and then three days later he did it and he did it well all right so james's mom follows him on a kayak on every swim up next he'll start training for a 21 mile swim with the goal of becoming the young person youngest person to complete the tahoe triple crown a California man is on a mission to find the owner of a journal filled with letters from a grandmother. Luis Martinez says he found the journal among clutter in a truck set for auction. Started looking through it and realized it belonged to Lola Maxine. She wrote several letters to her granddaughter, Arabella Ray. It just starts with my dear little hummingbird. I felt like writing to you today. Although we are miles apart, I hope I can feel healthy for a while so I can write several letters to you. Martinez thinks a woman who put pen to paper has passed away, so he wants to find her family. But he's not having any luck. He's hoping someone who sees this story will know the family and can help him get in touch with them. Pretty cool. Do you know why they call it the Godfather Swim out I, there in I Tahoe? Was, I don't know. I was going to ask you. If the main characters in the Godfather movies had an, a family compound on Lake Tahoe, the in, Corleone's. In the second movie. Yeah, Godfather 2 in particular. Yeah. I, I makes sense. I remember now. Yep. I've never heard of it, though, before. The Godfather Swim. How about that? 926, we are at 80 degrees more ahead on GMSA at 9. The Spurs took on the Nuggets in the NBA bubble yesterday, and it didn't go so well. David and RJ are back to discuss what went wrong. The state contends their coronavirus data is useful as long as we all understand the limitations. So what does that mean? And what are the limitations? Alana Rocha from the Texas Tribune explains after the break. Governor Abbott gets sued by members of the state legislature. And understanding the limitations of coronavirus data provided by the state, Alana Rocha from the Texas Tribune joins us with more. Good morning, Alana. So, Alana, five of the Texas legislature's most conservative members are suing Governor Greg Abbott and state health officials. They claim Texas leaders overstepped their bounds when they awarded a major contract for tracking Texas coronavirus outbreak to a little-known technology firm. The Tribune writes that this is bigger than this one contract. Yeah, this is uh, one of several attempts to uh, challenge the governor's authority that essentially his expanded policymaking authority afforded under an emergency declaration issued by the governor back in March. Um, this latest lawsuit uh, argues in it, uh, the lawmakers argue that Texas Constitution has a separation of powers and it's the legislature that's tasked with policymaking, not again the governor unilaterally even, you know, in these t tough times uh, to the extent that the governor has exercised it. Uh, as far as this contract goes with MTX, uh, the governor's office has defended it in the past, saying this company had uh, done similar work in other states and that these were federal funds, the $295 million, not state funds. Uh, still, they, uh, you know, we'll see where it goes. But again, this is one of many challenges prior to this. Um, 
the challenges haven't really gone anywhere. Alana, let's talk pandemic stats. It could be said that it's hard to collect good numbers on an unknown virus, and Texas health officials have made errors. But experts say the state's coronavirus data is useful as long as users understand its limitations. So what are those limitations? Um, you know, changing testing technologies, uh, bureaucratic changes, different reporting and counting and different levels of government. Uh, you know, this is new to everybody and the state does rank well nationwide when it comes to being transparent uh, in how it's counting things. I mean, but that doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, bode well for, for Texans who maybe just hear that there was corrections or errors and, and then that undermines their confidence in the data. Um, you know, we rank well, like I said, transparency wise, but uh, that can also backfire. Um, it's doing its job as far as big picture uh, guiding policy uh, throughout this pandemic, but you drill down to the, the nitty gritty and it gets a little confusing and, and perhaps questionable for some. Alana, dependent on tuition money, private schools are eager to get their children back into their classrooms, but they're weighing some different things on their public counterparts when deciding how and when to reopen, right? Uh, lawsuits, uh, you know, that they uh, as private entities are vulnerable to lawsuits. And so here they are limiting enrollments to be able to socially, you know, have kids socially distance. But then that means a loss of revenue. And yet they're having to spend costs that they didn't budget for to protect the kids. So big disinfecting machines, other safeguards uh, that they're they're spending to ward off potential lawsuits and, of course, keep everybody safe. But that is a consideration that they have to uh, look at that public schools protected as an extension of the government don't necessarily have to. Private schools will get a sizable amount of help in the CARES Act, some 40 plus million here in Texas alone. But um, still, their enrollment will be down. That means revenues down. And again, tough times for everyone. And lastly, new on the trip, uh, Ross Ramsey looks at whether the legislature should meet coming up in January during a pandemic. Yeah, and a lot of people will be watching those decisions because, you know, the state has advocated for in-person schools. Well, if the governor, you know, if the lawmakers aren't willing to come back to do in-person session, what does that mean? You know, they meet 140 days every two years. They don't have to meet that long but that's how long they can meet to tackle some big issues. A lot can wait, uh, but the budget uh, redistricting cannot. So Ross uh, lays it all out in a colorful way now at texastribune.org. Well, thank you so much, Alana. Of course, you can find all this and more on texastribune.org. Thanks, Alana. Taking a look outside with live cam, already 80 degrees. Oh, we have some clouds out there, but Justin, maybe we shouldn't be getting our hopes up for any kind of rain. No, those clouds are just those morning clouds. Unfortunately, no rain within those. Uh, we talked about earlier, there's an outside chance of a shower maybe this weekend down along the coast, but for most of us, we're pretty much stuck in this dry pattern. I want to show you a great picture on our KSAC Connect. We got a few in this morning. Uh, this is just one of them, Trixie. Joe from Seguin uh, passed along this picture. It looks like a little bit of fog there off in the distance in the cotton field, indicative of the fact that, that there's quite a bit of moisture out there. It's, it's humid this morning, of course, still probably a little bit of moisture in the ground from our rains on Monday, but that's quickly going to go away uh, as we're seeing some dry conditions. Once again, we want to pass this along. Uh, it is a CPS Energy Peak Energy Demand Day. Power grid will be a little stressed this afternoon with temperatures as hot as uh, hot as it's been and uh, maybe a little bit hotter today, around 100. Pollen count is in too. Molds in a moderate category at 840. It's down a bit from yesterday. And the forecast for today, 100. Southerly winds 5 to 15 and mostly sunny. Guys. Checking on traffic flow right now live at I-10 and Callahan looking eastbound. There's I-35 at Topper Wine. Another tough, tough loss for the Spurs in Orlando, and now their playoff chances, uh, they're going down. Uh, this really stinks. San Antonio yeah. fell to Denver to split the first four games in the NBA bubble. Here to not so sugarcoat it, David and RJ back to break it all down. Guys, this was this was ugly. I mean, the Sixers game, yeah. that hurt, but this one really hurt, too. Yeah. Sarah, was that some, like, non-playoff pain <laughs> that was? Uh, hey. Feeling it. Yeah. That's Feeling good. the hurt. Yeah. Can understand. Feel a little like that. After, after Denver. Yeah, the Philadelphia game, they may live to regret that one. 
not winning against Philadelphia. Yesterday, I think they just ran into a much better team. I mean, Denver is a solid basketball team from their last year. They competed with L.A. all the way through the mm -hmm. season for that top spot in the West. And then this year, they're right there with the Clippers and they're right there with L.A. So they're, they're a tough basketball team. Yeah, well, I think even after the game, Coach Pop said that Nikola Jokic, uh, Denver's big center, uh, reminds him of Larry Bird with his shooting, wow. passing abilities. And he also referred to him as Moses Malone. So uh, <laughs> that's pretty high praise there from yeah, Coach Pop. Amazing comparisons. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, the Spurs came out slow. I think they were still feeling a little bit of the sting from the Philly game. Managed to take the lead in the third quarter and the fourth quarter defense just absolutely fell apart yeah I think the Spurs lack of big men presence in the middle has been exposed it was exposed yesterday Philadelphia kind of exposed it but they were able to overcome it but I think yesterday the lack of and I agree with he we were talking a while ago and I agree with RJ I think for the first time we really saw mm -hmm. What a difference LaMarcus Aldridge can make, especially on the defensive end. Just being a big guy down there to, you know, clog up some of the some of the middle. And, and they could have used uh, another big guy down there yesterday, and they didn't they didn't have it. However, yeah. Yeah. I know there was the uh, the playoff moment. <laughs> I know that, that was there. But when you look at the way things are going, we talked about this months ago. All these guys are coming back, and and you know they've been off for a long time, so they're still trying to get their legs under them. They're still trying to get their shot. They're still there's a lot of things they're trying to work out, getting used to playing, you know, together again. Mm -hmm. And it's not like anybody's running away with this thing in these last eight games. The Spurs are still there. Yeah. Memphis lost Jaron Jackson, so they're they're not as uh, as strong as they were when they started this little eight game run and the Spurs still have a chance. I mean, right. We said right. they, you know, two might be the limit of losses, but they could still get in with three if things work there. Yeah. Way. So, so we have four games left. I think that uh, I've said all along that the Spurs have to go six and two, yep. at least five and three, at least to get in. But uh, they're right there. They're still right there. A couple of tough losses. I think these were the two toughest teams in this schedule. We have Utah, couple of games and of course the Rockets later on. Let me not forget about Houston, uh, but uh, Houston. <laughs> but uh, the two games against Utah. And uh, so we still have uh, some some competitive basketball to go. It may be hard to catch Memphis even now because there's still two games behind Memphis, but they're bat really they're battling Portland and New Orleans. They're tied with New Orleans, but they play them one time, as you said, and then Portland's right ahead of the Spurs right now. But Portland, mm -hmm. you talk about it running the gauntlet. Yeah. Portland's got, let's see, they've got Denver, they've got the Clippers, they've got Philly, they've got Dallas, and they've got Brooklyn left on the schedule. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the Spurs still have a shot at this thing. Yeah. They're not out of it just yet. And these two losses, very difficult to stomach after the first two games, but guys, the they continue to stick to the mantra. This is all about developing the young guys. So we're getting to see that. We're getting to see some of the hurt like Sarah had in her yeah. voice there. But uh, this is all about development. Patty Mills kept on saying, look, yep. this is what we're here for. So the playoffs would be great, but they want to develop yeah. these guys. I, I also, David, you put it this way too when you walked in the door this morning. You said in a nutshell, this is basically this, in being in the bubble, the way the Spurs are playing, just a continuation of what we saw before the pandemic yeah. begun. And that is a team that shows some amazing greatness on some plays. And then against tough teams, they tend to fall apart sometimes. Yeah, they, well, yesterday they were up seven. Mm -hmm. And then it was like it vanished in a, in a heartbeat. They were up against Philadelphia in the fourth quarter. And it yeah, vanished that's a tough one. in a heartbeat. It's yeah. like, oh, what happened to the league? <laughs> just like sitting here on the couch watching it. Yeah. It's like it's gone. Like, boom. So, but that's just this learning. And that's that, this, this yeah. trial and error they're going through, this learning experience mm -hmm. they're going through. So, hey, at least we'd have to play Phoenix because they're on like a, what, a four game win streak? Yeah, yeah, the Suns out of nowhere are now in yeah. this mix. So, so, uh, yeah, so yeah, very is. interesting. Some positives, though. Derek White, Keldon Johnson, those young guys look pretty great right now. And another positive the Lakers are struggling. <laughs> Yes. That's, that's always, always a great. Yes. <laughs> For a Spurs fan, that's always a win. Sorry, that's LeBron. Right. Yeah. <laughs> RJ, David, thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. 940, we're at 80 degrees. Watching GMSA at 9, and we'll be right back. Check this out. UCLA Mattel Children's Hospital has rushed a new tool into service amid the pandemics called Robin, the world's first emotionally intelligent hospital robot. It can interpret facial expressions and have dialogue. Oh my gosh, it looks like Wally. I knew it kind of does. Pediatric surgeon Dr. Justin Wagger says so many patients were feeling isolated because of COVID. They're limiting the number of visitors, but he says Robin dances with the kids, can provide empathy, and if nothing else, offers a distraction. Robin. So cute.
Justin's back now, and uh, right now we're taking a look at another. What, you've got the Coast Cast, is that what it's called? Coast Cast. And by the way, that robot reminds me. Did you, did you guys ever watch Saved by the Bell? You remember when Screech yes. had a robot? That's yes. what it reminds me of. Sean I remember Saved yeah. by the Bell. I yeah, remember I Screech. I don't remember the okay. robot, but I'm going to take your word for it. Super random. Warm. Sorry. Uh, yes. You're okay. You're okay. <laughs> there is a Coast Cast there behind me. Some folks headed to the, the beach this weekend. Rockport, Port A, Corpus. Uh, that's a place where. Uh, weather's going to be pretty good, but th there is a 20% chance of rain. There could be a couple showers down there, and we were kind of speaking to that earlier. There's a little bit of moisture coming in, and so if we're going to see any shower activity. It's probably going to be down there around Rockport uh, and Port A. Temperatures will be in the low 90s. It'll feel like it's in the 100s in some cases with all that humidity. It'll be a southeasterly breeze, 5 to 15, but all in all, pretty good weekend to uh, go down to the beach. So obviously, the, the water is uh, plenty warm down there. We've also been tracking the Saharan dust. Got one little small plume that's going to try to work in Sunday, but the models have even backed off of this a little bit. I don't even think we're going to notice it. Shouldn't be a big problem. I know folks with asthma get concerned about it, and rightfully so, but I don't think this is going to cause us much issues. Certainly not like the plumes that we saw earlier this year that moved through that were much, much thicker. Uh, the, it looks like the dust has sort of calmed down a little bit, and that's why tropical activity has picked up. Less dust there is out there. Uh, the, the more uh, the more tropical activity you tend to get in the Atlantic. There is one little area Hurricane Center is watching 10% chance of development. It's really low end and it looks pretty bad on satellite pictures. So I don't think we're going to see much here. And the rest of the Atlantic is actually pretty quiet. Uh, but keep in mind, we're not even to the peak of hurricane season yet. That doesn't come until September. So we got plenty of time here for more de development. And it promises to be a busy year. Josephine would be next on the list, followed by Kyle and Laura, and we'll see how far through the list we get this year. They are predicting quite a few storms. High pressure over top of Texas. This is keeping things very toasty. 101 in San Angelo today, 101 Midland, 100 in San Antonio, 99 in Waco today. Not much rain. Everything's going up and around this ridge, so you'll find some storms up there around Kansas and Oklahoma. A few showers there far east of Texas, but nothing, nothing for us. Just some morning clouds. And it's sticky out there, 81. Feels like 86, though, because that dew point is at 73. You can pick up on some of these clouds that uh, we have going on here around Bear County. They sort of line up those lines of clouds, but they'll start to break up. And they're already doing that. Uh, we'll see quite a bit of sun, I'd say, by noontime. 79, Bernie Stage, 84 right now in Castroville, 82, Carrizo Springs. You got clear skies out in Del Rio, it's 83. You got off to a warm start this morning. And you look at the heat index, when you factor in the humidity, there are some places already getting close to 100. Uh, just to give you an idea, places like Beeville. Uh, but the heat index, 93 in Gonzales, feels like 94 right now, pleasant. Pretty brutal. 91 degrees noontime, mostly sunny. We'll be up around 100. The high today, heat index could go anywhere from 102 to 105 here in town. And then 100 tomorrow, 99 Saturday with a coastal shower to Saturday, Sunday. And then Monday, Tuesday looks awful warm, 101 both days. And, you know, looking at the extended forecast, it does look like this high pressure tries to break down a little bit, maybe past our seven day forecast there. But in the meantime, it's just just hot. Justin, taking a look at the list of those hurricane names, mm -hmm. Teddy at the very end, yeah. it just sounds like too sweet of a name to be a tropical storm or hurricane. Like, like Nana. Nana. I know. Yeah, my, yeah. That's what I call my grandmother. We call mm -hmm. her Nana. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how that's going to play out. Some but we'll pretty see. endearing terms there. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. 948, 81 degrees. We'll take a look at today's 9 at 9. That's next. 951, the Bear County Jail having a hard time controlling the spread of COVID-19. Plus, some Bank of America customers had a bit of a scare when checking their bank account balance. Here's today's 9 at 9. County Judge Nelson Wolf says the situation in the county jail is actually getting worse. We had brought down our COVID cases in the jail to 20, uh, maybe 30 days or so ago. Uh, but each day is creeping up and now we're 129 in the jail have COVID. With the country making up nearly a quarter of all COVID-19 cases and deaths across the globe, Dr. Anthony Fauci says the outbreak here in the U.S. is the worst in the world and testing must be improved. One new safety indicator has been added to the city's COVID-19 dashboard, which will help gauge when it's safe to welcome students back. 
Green shows the risk is low, but social distancing and face coverings in close contact will still be necessary. Yellow and red mean schools have an option to reopen, but exposure is still a possibility. President Trump floating a nomination acceptance speech from the White House and is no longer planning to accept his nomination at the RNC convention in Charlotte. The DNC also pulling the plug on its convention in Milwaukee. Former Vice President Joe Biden now plans to give a speech from his home state of Delaware. The Trump campaign is now suing the state of Nevada after Democrats there passed a law to send ballots to every registered voter and allow ballots to be counted even after Election Day. U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper says the blast in Beirut was likely an accident. Esper says information about the explosion is still coming in, but the U.S. is ready to send humanitarian assistance to Lebanon. Legislation has stalled and it's impacting the census. It would have extended the deadline for the 2020 census, but without the legal measure, field collection for the nation's headcount will stop at the end of September instead of the end of October. 75 years after the U.S. dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan is still pushing for a world free of nuclear weapons. Survivors, relatives, and foreign dignitaries gathered to honor those killed and pray for peace on a at a memorial service in Japan. Bank of America customers woke up Wednesday wondering where their money had gone. Thousands logged in to find a zero staring at them on their account balances. The bank confirmed there was an online glitch showing incorrect account balances for online and mobile users. Tomorrow on GMSA at 9, it was one of Time Magazine's top inventions for 2019. OrCam technology helps the blind and visually impaired process visual information by communicating it with audio. Our Alicia Barretta speaks to one man who says his quality of life has been restored thanks to the device. That's tomorrow at 9. And yeah, we're up to 83. We'll be up around 100 this afternoon. 100 tomorrow. Hot forecast all the way through. Maybe a couple showers uh, closer to the coast Saturday and Sunday. Well, a passionate pediatric doctor up in Norman, Oklahoma, has nailed a redo of a popular 90s rap song by adding her own lyrics about car seat safety, and the internet has been singing along. And it's one of those songs that's going to be in your head for the rest of the day, I'm sorry, but just take a listen. I like safe kids and I cannot lie. You other mothers can't deny. When a car rolls by with an itty bitty babe not strapped in their place, you get sprung. Want to pull up because you notice that kid ain't. <laughs> oh, Dr. Kate Cook might want to keep her day job, but it's an important <laughs> one because we can sure appreciate her hilarious rendition of Baby Got Back. She's, before with that little clip, she said, I'd like to apologize to my children and anyone with any sort of musical ability for what I'm about to do before she began rapping. But her message, while entertaining, does touch on a serious subject, and that is car seat safety for all kids. It can be confusing, she says, for parents when recommendations keep changing, mm -hmm. but we know they want to have the correct information so they can keep their kid as safe as possible. Uh, Cook got the help in her music video from the Norman Fire Department, from the Norman Police Department, and the Norman Regional Hospital System. Um, but uh, yeah, the recommendations do keep changing, but she said, yeah, if you, if you can, keep your baby's rear facing in their car seat for as long as possible. Her kids. I think it's precious. Awesome. I, I love the video. It's also on the internet forever. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Thank you, guys.